Welcome to today's podcast brought to you by Chris Heidel and Neil Modi, where we talk about our reflections on the marketplace by day. Chris Heidel is a registered investment advisor, and I, Neil Modi, am a venture capitalist focused on med devices. So the, the, the guest we're going to have on today, um, it, you know, it is a sleep doctor. And, you know, he actually studied uh, gerontology, aging. He studied uh, sleep medicine. He studied cannabis medicine, um, did 10 years of research at Hopkins, uh, now works at Canyon Ranch, which is a wellness center slash, um, uh, it's east, east, west, west for medicine, right? I think that's a pretty good description of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I thought with the not so sleepy market, um, some of us may not be sleeping as well. And we might actually just talk to him a little bit about immunity and sleep. And then, then we'll go to our normal market segment. And so he'll join us in, in just a few minutes. Um, mm -hmm. But I thought we might start the episode with a game of predictions, Chris, your very favorite thing in the world. Ah, you do this to me. Every <laughs> I'm going to make this part of our podcast every time now. <laughs> yeah. So my, uh, what, what am I? Uh, you know what? You know what? We're, here's what we're going to do, Chris. Yeah. We're going to keep track of our predictions over the course of the year. And whoever loses between us, meaning the, the smallest number of uh, predictions uh, uh, correct, um, has to donate two hundred dollars to the Danny Barker Foundation. Two hundred dollars to Danny Barker Foundation is a good idea. Can you tell them about the Danny Barker Foundation before we go into our predictions, the, pretty please? Um, Daniel Moses Barker Foundation is dedicated to preserving um, and proselytizing, pushing forward the music of New Orleans. Um, Danny Barker was a seminal figure in New Orleans music. He's kind of unsung. He was always a sideman, but was truly a leader. Um, and he formed a brass band because he saw that the New Orleans tradition was dying when he returned from um, a long sojourn into New York as a professional musician. Coming back to New Orleans, he started a brass band that had so many of today's foremost exponents of New Orleans music, like Wynton Marsalis, Branford uh, were in that band, Herlin Riley, a great, fantastic drummer. Um, uh, Leroy Jones, who was Harry Connick Jr.'s trumpet player for years. Lucian Barbarin, who played uh, trombone with uh, Harry Connick. So, so many of those guys. The whole of the Dirty Dozen Brass Band. Um, you're great effort. So you're not very people. good at describing this charity. Can I give it a shot? Yeah, give it a shot. <laughs> this charity gives instruments to kids who can't yeah. afford them to, to learn to play. Yeah, that, it does that. It does that, and we host a festival every year over the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday in New Orleans, too. So, so, so are you game for the bet, Chris? Like, just based on am, our predictions? I am Let's do this. That. I think it'll be fantastic. Um, we're going to figure out some way, because our audience is growing, to let them participate um, in, in betting some of our money to the Denny Barker Foundation. Oh. So I don't know what that is, but by summer we'll get that figured out. They can play along. Uh, we'll figure out how to do a survey or something. People can play along with us and um, uh, take both of our monies as well. How's that? Sounds great. I think it'd be just a fun thing um, <laughs> at, to, to show how bad we are at predictions. What if we both score zeros? We tie. But dead great. Lock. We're both going to donate, right? Yeah, like, okay. this is great. Well, I'm just clearing up the rules. <laughs> what's, uh, what's, uh, what what uh, is the lineup? What are we predicting? So, okay. Um, Let's talk about, uh, I guess, first we'll go with uh, U.S. equities, uh, publicly traded things, and then we'll go with a little of venture capital. So I guess the first thing I'm wondering is, you know, are the Dow and the NASDAQ going to go lower uh, as a composite um, from where they are today, Friday, April 3rd at 212 Pacific? I'm going to so guess yes. In, except are they going to go lower than they are and they is, are there, is there a date we have to assign this by? I yeah, mean, sorry, in the next 90 days. In the next 90 days. So 90 days from now, if the the indexes are lower, then 
that's a correct prediction is what you're saying. Correct. And so I'm predicting yes. 90 days from now, which index? All of them? General? You, you, you choose. I, I'm, I'm not just saying the NASDAQ in, as a composite. Oh, the NASDAQ. And the, yeah. and the Dow. The NASDAQ and the Dow, yes, lower. 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 Do, do you want to just add comments on how much lower? Just to make it more fun for you? Oh, gosh, now. Um, I don't know. I just don't think that this um, correction has run its course. Um, and that's based on statistical history um, and just our experience in this crisis. We're just very early in it. And I think there are more um, economic and um, shocks generally to come. So I still think it's a bumpy road, but uh, probably leads lower. Do you, do you, do you want to try and actually answer the question I asked you? Do you want to take a guess on the well, percentage? Are you asking me to give a number? Of course yeah, I am. You've never, you've never been right yet, so let's try it. This is uh, not a. This is not for part of the bet. Just to. This is not inclusive of a bet. I'm going to say at least twenty percent lower. That's my bet. How's that? Oh, okay. If that's if that's the framing of it, I would say um, from today's closing. Uh, we have what the Dow at twenty one thousand fifty two. I'd say um, from here it'll go fifteen uh, percent lower. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we should add this to our bet. I I'm going to reinclude it because we're we're so close, fifteen and twenty percent. Okay. Yeah. Um, Gold, the price of gold, where is it going to be in 90 days? Like, is it going to be higher or lower? We'll just make this really easy for you. The higher. price of gold in the higher. next 90 days. Do you want to take a guess on percentage? I agree with you. 12%. I'm going to go with 20 again. Ooh. I think we haven't seen peak fear due to COVID-19 yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm basing that on. Uh, I think I mean, peak fear will make gold more valuable to to my peeps the indian people <laughs> the world the world's coming around to the subcontinents <laughs> <laughs> even though i was born I in the know, united states I know it that way too um what about uh interest rates neil Ten Ooh, are, are we going to get to negative interest rates is what you're asking me in the united states mm -hmm. in 90 days i don't know but what do you no. think not 90 days no because i i think that um I think that the president who seems to have some control over some of this shit somehow now is recognize, is going to recognize, wake up that all the stimulus he's putting in isn't really going to do as much as he thinks it is to both help the economy from being sick and to get him reelected. So I don't know that he's going to push the interest rate button in 90 days. Oh, interest rate button. But there will be a fourth round of stimulus, I think. I believe so. I don't think okay, it'll I be interesting. there'll be a round four. So what's yours? 90-day bond. Treasury bonds, um, interest rates on the 10-year will be lower. I don't think negative. Um, I think the, the massive stimulus plan is um, blocking that. But I think rates go lower before they start to move higher again. So Tanner, you have to add this to your calendar to help us report back in 90 days, by the way. <laughs> Tanner, you're hired. <laughs> where. Thank you. Um, Adam Newman from WeWork. Mm. Will, will he build a venture-backed company that gets to $250 million in value again? No. I don't think so either. My prediction. And uh, that's got to go more than ninety days. He's going to try to. Yeah, we'll it. say we'll say thirty six months. <sighs> yeah, thirty six months, and I say no. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen in his life again. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. will the Vision Fund rise again? Three years, five years, ten years. I, I'll give you ten years. I'm just I'm curious about what you think, since you look at things from a public markets again. Will will, will the Vision Fund? get to 50 billion again. No, I think this is a, a rejoinder to the Adam Newman fiasco. I think um, the vision fund, the vision fund and um, 
Maya Son, I think that their process is now extremely questionable. <laughs> Let me just say that. So, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. I, I was happy for them that they were selling um, the Alibaba stock, right? Because I think it's overinflated. So, oh, my goodness. <laughs> good for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, let's talk about valuations over the next 90 days. I, I don't know if the, the data will be available for life science companies, but um, I'm going to predict that valuations go down by a quarter over the next 90 days, 25%. So there's less deals to begin with anyway. We're talking, mm -hmm. you know, rounds A through D. Um, next 90 days, are they going to go down by 25%? I'm going to say yes. You're better off picking the under, Chris, just to help you out with this. Yeah. Yeah. It's a I better bet. I would agree with you. I think the values will fall more. Oh, you think the values will fall more than 25%? Yeah. I think so. I think 30, 35, 30 to 35%. 30 to 35%. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Well, that may make things, you know, just more realistic, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? I, I obviously, uh, we talked a little bit about that. I don't think things will be quite as founder friendly and people's feet will be held to the fire for what they say they can do more often, which is never a bad thing in life. This is true. <laughs> you have to be a realist investing. We've all been in places where we were more hopeful than real. You know? Right. <laughs> it's the wrong order. Wrong order. Right. Um, any other uh, predictions you want us to take a prediction on related to the startup life sciences world? Me, no. Um, yeah, just how quickly we'll get the serology test. How quickly we'll be able to test for antibodies. I'll actually put some, you know what we should do is we should actually have Eric Ten, um, my partner at Zoic Capital on a podcast because he studied molecular diagnostics in his PhD and, you know, he's head of diligence for us. And we look mm -hmm. at a lot of diagnostics in general. And, you know, he spent a couple of hours today breaking down for me um, the breakdown in getting tests um, mm -hmm. from every major company and, um, the potential optionality that allows for from uh, the David versus Goliath story and the startups versus, you know, the lab cores of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't, why don't we actually have him on the next couple of weeks? That sounds great. Yeah. Um, I, I, you, you, so, I, you know, I guess I think we'll start to get good testing, um, regular testing a after the peak. Just want to try and say that. So After I think we'll start in infections. Yeah. So I, you know, so I think we're going to hit peak fear in April. I've said that since January. Um, and I think we'll probably start to see tests in, um, in the United States. I want to be more clear. I think we'll be able to more regularly get tested without having to wait in two hours in a drive through or actually have to be sick, um, by September, October. Got it. And that's to test for infection or for antibodies, Neil? Um, that's going to be to test for infection. Uh -huh. um, I don't think that's going to be to test for antibodies. Although yeah. I think that's probably the cure to getting uh, the workforce back to work. If you've got the right antibodies um, mm -hmm. and you can work, like let's put you back to work. If you don't, let's keep you home. Yes. Yeah. When will we all return to work, Neil? Um, when will we all return to work? That's different than when I'll return to normal work. Um, I guess I'm working more hours now, so my wife seems to be as well. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's the same for you. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I don't know that I've really left work. Um, I, I think things will normalize it in the summer, just as they did in the Spanish flu a little bit. And then we'll see our, you know, we're seeing the second wave starting in Asia right now, um, in in Singapore. And I suspect in China that we're not getting good data as we normally talk about from China. Um, right. right. And 
I, I think people are going to start traveling again a little bit more in September. I think there's a chance we'll go on vacations in December again. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm going to be looking for resorts in short order to, to book my December vacation that are 100% refundable. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I can get the, the cheap rate while fear is still still abound in the market. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, when do you think we'll return? I think the drive, um, of course, is to return as soon as possible. And I think that probably means... Um, by the end of May, mid to late May. So mid May to late May, I think um, most offices um, will open. I think by the end of May, you'll have restaurants back open again. Um, I don't know what that means though for the willingness of people to engage in that behavior. I don't know what theme parks <laughs> are gonna do this summer. Um, concerts or certainly cruise ships. I don't know when that industry, I think there's a definite demand destruction in that space. Um, and possibly with airlines too, maybe they'll give us more room. <laughs> but for a guy like you, Neil, who flies business class, it may not matter. <laughs> I'm not sure what to say back. <laughs> <laughs> maybe uh, that's unfair. <laughs> I was only kidding. Yeah. So it um it's fascinating to see this i mean certainly we see the immediate demand destruction in in industries like the energy space um but this uh sort of a return to work and then a return to normalcy i guess or or some sense of what was um are two different questions so um is your now microsoft um for whom Riganko works they must have um she must have been able to work remotely uh, pretty four pretty weeks. For, yeah, yeah, it must be built into the culture too, right? No, I don't, it's not really built into the culture um, to, to work from home. It's it's definitely possible. I mean, she's been mm -hmm. in India and worked. You know, when mm -hmm. she's busy, been visiting her parents in Mumbai, she's you know attending meetings in Redmond. Um, but she hasn't ever really done it for more than a week or two. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and she did it, you know, the longest. I guess she did it for three weeks when she broke her foot and decided to, to mm. do it to recover in India. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, most people tend trend in Seattle to just go into their offices. Um, yeah. yeah. Though you know, for four weeks now, my dining room has become her office, um, and you know, for me that's better. She's now for the very first time starting to talk about how. Um, uh, she hopes that she'll work from home two days a week when it all, when it all yeah. comes back. Right. Like, and yeah. this is, uh, some of the conversation, I don't know if we had on the podcast or uh, on the phone about how, you know, we work and, and Regis and all of these mm -hmm. other offices, office places are about to take a major hit because why, wh mm -hmm. why are people going to go in as often? I think those, um, might die. Just entirely. I don't know. I don't know I about entirely because I'd still like to go to an office occasionally, but. For, yeah. Yeah. I'll just use I'm yours like... more often. <laughs> yeah. I might shrink my square footage. Who knows? But I think that, uh, you know, like those, that idea of the Capital One Cafe and um, Starbucks or Intelligentsia or some coffee chains having a more dedicated, like, pseudo office space i guess they can't have meeting rooms really but they're gonna recapture a lot of that market um but you're right there's certainly tremendous demand destruction in that uh business model and it was um weak to begin with you know such a huge mismatch in um assets and liabilities in the income versus the long-term leases yeah short-term income and long-term leases very I mean, month to month, <laughs> it's a crazy, crazy model. But anyway, yeah, others, um, other industries that'll be impacted, um, certainly um, some retail, right? We'll see um, a bigger shift to online. Yes. Um, so it, some demand destruction. You know, I, I love Amazon because they're in Seattle and I have lots of friends who work there and I don't mm -hmm. love Amazon. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, you mm -hmm. know, am I destroying the world by ordering? 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think part of what you said about uh, Merganka wanting to work home from home two days a week, it's a sign of a, a more reflective nature. People are reevaluating what is important to them and how they want to live and work. It might mean we're a little more considered in our purchases, but Amazon does make it very easy to point and click. And on your porch, it appears. It uh, <laughs> seems like, uh, yeah, if we're not mindful, the consumption could escalate um, through those channels. But people will have a love-hate relationship with the winner-take-all is not always um, the American favorite, right? Create the... Um, a little bit of a, a, a um, I don't know what the word I'm searching for is. It's a, a little bit of conflict, I guess. Yeah, for sure. You right. Know? I have conflict we, in ordering from Amazon. Yeah. No, no question. Yeah we, yeah, we root for the underdog and we're thought of, we think of business as uh, relationship based. And there's a there's a certain sense of scale where it seems to disappear, even if it's um, even if it's promoted that way, it seems uh, inauthentic. You know, I'm anyway. I'm curious about what the the top questions you've kind of gotten this week from your clients in general, um, the ones you wish you could have answered better, or you have better information on the ones you wish you had been asked. I think, well, right now the world is so panicked, and the markets are really uh, one of the few <laughs> entertainment venues that are open, <laughs> so. There's a lot of attention on the financial markets. And the entertainment ever, venue. The markets aren't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, there's no sports. There's, you know, uh, the, it's, um, it um, is consuming. And a lot of uh, what I think we see reflected, these 6% moves up and down, this tremendous volatility is um again like a raw shock test we can see our panic and anxiety and also our our understanding and even greed all writ large on these market moves and most of the questions i get are um or thoughts are just those of understanding i think people recognize that there's a tremendous amount of fear out there in our collective consciousness there's a, a lot of concern and we just are really flying blind what what will be the long-term impacts of, of COVID? You know, we, we haven't even gotten to the peak, um, so we don't know what it looks like. Um, some families have been very hard hit. It creates more fear. I don't know. It just seems that, um, like you were saying, Neil, the, the definite trend in the market doesn't seem broken. It's um, a bumpy road, but more downward than upward. And I think that's a reflection, too, of just how people feel, because there are values in the marketplace now that are extremely compelling. They are generational. This is a very, very inexpensive market in certain corners. The indexes, though, are still trading at high levels. You know, the market fell from um, levels which were either the first or second highest in history, depending on which value measure you use, like price to sales versus price to book value or something like that so so you're feeling for the you're feeling the best you've maybe felt ever about your portfolio for your clients yeah but you know i can't say we haven't taken hits there are some things that you know no one anticipated this and certainly the fallout's been fascinating because um on saint patrick's day of the week of uh april 17th um we saw this huge liquidity crunch you know there were so many redemptions in the ETF and mutual fund space, that to meet those investor requests, um, there was a tremendous amount of selling. It cascaded into the bond markets, into the mortgage markets. Um, you know, you just saw this, the markets froze. Um, on the afternoon of the 18th, I don't think there was a mortgage bond that traded <laughs> from three o'clock until the Fed said, okay, we're going to come in and we'll open a window and offer, uh, we'll accept mortgage-backed securities as collateral. I mean, they haven't done that since the great financial crisis. It, um, I think, was the right thing to do. They are to function as the lender of last resort with high-quality collateral. That definition's changed over the years, but I think it was the right thing to do and ease the the technical crunch in the Wait, marketplace. So, so, but so, so answer my question directly. 
yes or no, you're the happiest with where you've ever been in your portfolio? Yes, I think as far as the forward looking, very, very excited because, um, yeah, the values are very compelling. And, um, and, and, yeah. and Param, our guest, you can join in for this part of the conversation. We'll go to you in a bit to talk more about sleep. But uh, uh, Par Param, welcome aboard. Awesome. Now, as I'm listening in, these are topics I'm hearing everybody talk about, whether it's during their waking hours or in the middle of the night. These are all the conversations that are ongoing 24-7, it feels. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I can create a sleep well at night portfolio for everyone, but that's what I try to do. <laughs> right on. Swan. A swan. Yeah, a, swan. It's a, a beautiful swan. Yeah. <laughs> they look like ugly ducklings now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, going up river, going upstream. I, you know, I want to dive just a little deeper, Chris, and and, and Param again. Ask mm -hmm. any questions you want along the way, because we promise to put you on the the stand after a little while here, um, mm -hmm. and make you as uncomfortable as we possibly can with questions. So uh, do, feel free to start the same with Chris. Um, yeah. um, Chris, what other? You know, let's assume you know we're at Friday. The market closed. Um, most of your mm -hmm. clients are going to listen to this. A bunch of your prospective clients are going to listen to this. What is it they should mm -hmm. be knowing this weekend about the market, about their portfolios at a high level, right? Because everybody's got a little bit different a strategy with you. Yeah. Well, I think uh, just the clear recognition that this has all changed so astonishingly fast. Um, the the opportunity set for investing um, has shifted, but largely we'll get through this and the uh, portfolio positions we um, favor, of course, already have given us a margin of safety. So we're good, really. Uh, we're not exposed to industries um, other than uh, some energy exposure, which was untimely. But other than that, um, we're not exposed to industries where we'll really have tremendous demand destruction. And that, um, on the other side of this, we'll get to, um, will reward us handsomely. I think it's very safe, secure, and we've got uh, portfolios too that generate income securely now because of the fall in prices. So um, in many ways, portfolios are more balanced and um, even more stable and secure. So it's a, it's a very good environment now going forward. Um, even though I do expect, as we talked about, more bumps in the road, but nothing that, um, should shake our conviction that when we get through this, we'll be better. Chris, I'm going to call you on Sunday just to ask you a little bit more about the market personally. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I know that one of the ways you've been a good trader for a long time is keeping a lot of balance personally, right? Through, through meditation and mm -hmm. movement and um, making sure you're getting a chance to really reset. And so today I wanted to obviously have uh, Dr. Param Dadia on the podcast to kind of talk through sleep and immunity with us um, mm -hmm. uh, because he spent so much time studying them um, at Hopkins and that uh, Canyon Ranch where he currently is and just independently. Um, Param, do you mind just giving a little better intro of yourself than, than the one I'm trying to give of you? Uh, love it. Uh, intro is great. <laughs> so who am I? Why am I speaking on this topic? Uh, first and foremost, because I adore the opportunity to share any thoughts on how people can live their best life and to talk to people that I want to be around. So thank you guys for letting me be here right now. Mm. Um, I got into medicine as an internal medicine uh, person. Uh, that means adult medicine in simple speak. I was in Baltimore. I was at Johns Hopkins just shy of 10 years. Going on, did some other interesting things there. And yet I was always interested not just talk about what's wrong, but how can we take the next step to live our best lives? So not just about sickness, which is my formal training, but what is health? Define it and create it for people. So that moved me into this thing called integrative medicine, lifestyle medicine. And when I started into this, what did I think I was gonna be speaking about? Well, the way to eat and the way to move. So it's a topic that I've been very interested in because of my own personal journey. I mean, healthy weight is always a topic uh, that's been there and always will be there. But what did I find out? I can know what to do. But do I always do it? Mm. Hmm. Right? Not to be awkward. Are <laughs> doctors the healthiest people? You guys? <laughs> I'm 
I'm not trying to spell that, but I will uh, take that as a definitive, right? So now that we know, just because we know and don't do, we should be talking not just what to do, but why do we do? And that's one of the earliest ways I got into sleep. As an internal medicine guy, sleep is for the heart. Yeah, number one cause of death and dying, heart health. But take it even further, the conversation of sleep. Let me frame this for us. Well, frame it well, around guys, COVID-19 like for doing? us, right? Like, because we're curious. Like, Chris, Chris wants right to here. be able to tell his what wife about this doing? after this podcast because we're not sure if she listens. Yep, yep. That's right. right there, right there. So what we do know is what do we feel like doing if we have the fever or the flu? Sleep. Sleep. Mm-hmm. So right there is probably the easiest place to put our foot onto this conversation. I mean, there is no question we've known, you know, from that of great grandma's medicine, you know, eat your vegetables, go out and play and get your sleep. The data on this is, is launching. And boy, a time like today, time like the month that we are a part of is absolutely bringing this prime time. So giving it an idea, like where would I, with some of my earliest readings on this and therefore experience. Okay, we've talked about vaccinations. We're hopeful for some new ones to come out. If you take the flu vaccine, how do you get the best benefit from it? They've shown these in studies. A person who takes a vaccine and gets a good night's sleep gets a much better response from their vaccine. So again, right now we're pulling back the the, the veil to say that sleep is going to augment everything else we do. So many times right now, guys, people are calling me saying, what's something I can do to take care of myself? How can I boost my immune system? And they're expecting me to talk about some magic pill because of lifestyle ways of talking. They want me to say what I should eat, mm-hmm. you know, what type of uh, exercise. And what's my favorite answer? Get your sleep. Mm-hmm. We know that you can measure all these things. And boy, it becomes an alphabet soup. It becomes a word salad, CRP, uh, sedimentation rate, interleukins. I mean, all these funny things. But most importantly is we know that there's two major ways to look at sleep, quantity and quality. You got to get enough time and and you've got to make sure you're getting quality. And let me just pause there as you guys think about that, right? Because I want to make sure that this is um, something that you guys are hearing it and so everybody else can hear it, right? Think about quantity. Well, we go to bed at a certain hour and we get up at a certain hour. So we have an estimate in there. And we say, oh, you know, it took me a little while to get to sleep and stay asleep. Mm. So on top of that, we've done that for a while. But what we do know is, is that there's tracking devices. I get asked all the time, people come in with me, whatever they're wearing, or they'll pull out their phone. Well, right now I'm doing more telehealth, but nevertheless, people uh, will still show me up on the monitor on the video, hey, look at what it looked like last night. And I just want to give people an appreciation. We're getting better in the science, but that's still a good step because when you take a look at some of the tracking devices, don't look at it night to night, but look at generally, how did the last week look like and how was it the week before? It gives you good trending, but it doesn't give you precision. Don't let you know this precision become the harbinger, meaning you don't have to be perfect. Mm-hmm. You just want to get an idea. Mm-hmm. But here's a, a bigger conversation. We ask people, well, quality of sleep. And all right, I'm talking to two guys that know business. You guys have a high challenge for distress. People can talk business. And the people that I see generally are people that have a high tolerance for distress. And they can, therefore, put up with other things that other people can't. So if I ask them, hey, how are you doing? Are you sleepy? What are the most entrepreneurs, what do most investors tell me? Eh, I'm fine. Doing good enough. Hey, no sense belly aching. Mm. I just got to do what you got to do. Mm-hmm. So what I find classically is that a lot of people are just assuming they're getting their sleep. And by the time that they want to talk to me about it, it's actually been a little bit behind the eight ball because now this has been going on for a while. And by the time they come to see me, they're really kind of miserable. So the reason why I'm so happy to speak about this is to get an appreciation of helping people know, are they getting quantity of sleep? But that much harder one is quality because people may or may not know that they're getting quality sleep, which sounds odd. So let me ask you guys, what what kind of sleep do you guys get? What's the best way to know um, the quality or measure it? Yeah. I mean, we're in the stone age. I mean, I was like, you know, and anything in technology and anybody who looks at these conversations, we're doing just questionnaires to people, right? Are you sleepy? Right? I mean, that's Mm -hmm. a nice measure. It's not that we throw that one out. Let me give you some questions, right? So let's just kind of give you a a whiff test. The following are not normal. It's not normal to fall asleep when reading a book in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a boring book, you should be awake. 
It's not normal to drift off at an afternoon meeting. Wait, hold on. Meeting, Let us try and answer or... these one at a time. So <laughs> Chris and I will yeah, get, yeah. we can get some, some, some feedback here. I love it. Chris, yeah, Chris, yeah, thank you for these questions. Chris, probably about half the time I can fall asleep reading a book in the middle of the afternoon. What about you? You uh, half the time? I don't. Uh, I can. Yeah. yeah. I, I can probably a third of the time. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, guys. Give yourself, um, you know, a set out of a scale of three, three being absolutely exhausted. I mean, just kind of keep the notes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Neil, I'm hearing for that first question, uh, a 50 50 I'll, chance. No, I'm falling asleep if I let myself, right? Like, I don't really let myself fall asleep mm -hmm. while I'm reading. I need to, I need to yeah. keep pushing forward on too many things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and then also, Chris, about the same. He said once guard. Yeah, it's the same suggestion that I, um, I, I can feel sometimes uh, when I'm reading that uh, my attention drifts off. And it does mm -hmm. uh, feel like uh, I could nap if I wanted to. <laughs> Yeah, and that there, right? I'm going to be a little bit irritating in a hopefully helpful way. I'm going to call it irritating for other reasons, but irritating in the sense that, oh, you know, if you've got a really healthy night of sleep, meaning quantity and quality, you should be able to get through that boring book. Mm -hmm. So the fact that there is a little bit there, let's, you know, one question is one question. I love it, Neil, for slowing me down. Let's go to the next question. The following is not normal. Not normal to fall asleep at a, in an afternoon oh, meeting. Yeah, never for me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank heavens we're doing this podcast right. <laughs> now, right? Otherwise, that would be yeah. Yeah. Stuff, right? Like dead air, right? It's like the death of everything. It, it, uh, the next one that's not uh, to be healthy, meaning it's not normal to fall asleep while watching TV. I'm not talking bedtime, but in the early evening. Mm -hmm. um, not normal. I'd probably do it like one out of 10 times if I'm watching t if i'm watching tv sure not the same thing yeah no i don't but but my like to i mean to, in my defense i'm going to add some defensiveness here if my <laughs> wife is watching the hallmark channel and another <laughs> another uh romance movie you know it's okay if i sleep sometimes that's the better option yeah all right. It's your way no, that's fair you. enough. I think I'll, <laughs> we'll be politely just kind of smiling. Right, right on. Mm -hmm. Next one, it's not normal to fall asleep in a theater no. or in a waiting room. Yeah. No for me as well. All right. Thank goodness. Yeah, thank God. Yeah. Not normal to fall around. asleep. Yeah. Next one, not normal to fall asleep after lunch. So I'd say you had an endless bowl of pasta. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. What is the chances you could stay awake after 100%. that? Just to yeah, be clear, are you 100% or you stay awake? That I could stay awake. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, I didn't ask it well. All right. You guys are looking pretty good. Um, if I gave you an afternoon nap time, the following, it's not normal to be able to fall asleep if laying down in the afternoon. Oh, I could fall asleep if you give me enough time. Yeah, I'm pretty comfortable falling asleep. Yeah. yeah, if I had a nap time and I were lying down. <laughs> no trouble. I could Sounds like asleep, paradise. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm changing my calendar now. Next question. It's not normal, and this is the narcolepsy question, so just know that I doubt you guys have it, but we'll ask it. It's not normal to fall asleep while sitting and talking Chris, to someone. Chris, Ooh, Chris, yeah, Chris, no, never. Chris, Thank tell goodness. the truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I guess I wouldn't know all the time. Well, maybe it would, it would, would tell me. No one's told me. And so it's never I happened think. for you. All right, yeah. all right. Fair and last one, ready for the zinger, gents? Yes. Ready? The following is not normal. It's not normal to fall asleep at a stoplight or a Never traffic happened. light. Ooh. No. I'd be yeah. scared. Not yeah. Right? Yeah. Here's something to would interest you and anybody listening in. This is more common than any of us want to know. Let me frame that. Drinking and driving, of course, they do not mix. It's an impairment. Mm -hmm. Between the end of the United States, they show data that gives people an appreciation 
that more deaths are from sleepiness behind the wheel than drinking and driving. Wow. Many, I mean, I was in medical training and I was in the era where you would work 30 ish, 40 ish hours and then go home. Right. right? I could I say to you right now that I don't do that anymore, but it gives us an appreciation of the significance of that in the state of New Jersey. Yeah, after 16 hours, a truck driver needs to pull off because we do know after that time, the person performs as if they have an alcohol level of 0.05. Chris, did your grandfather ever fall asleep after treating all those people as a country doc in the middle of nowhere while you were driving? No. Um, he made it a point to leave with uh, time before uh, the sun would set. So I think that oh, you went with him a bunch of times, right? For a while. Yeah, well, a few times. We didn't. He didn't really drive in the dark. Got it. Um, I think that helped him. He started early, but no, no, he would he would do it. I'd sit with his medical bag on my lap and ride. Yeah, but no. So, so Param, are you really. ready to grade us? Like, how did we do overall? Yeah, yeah. So, um, first and foremost, um, smile because <laughs> um, for both of you. You guys scored five, right? I, I took a questionnaire that's out there. For those people that need the data, it's called the Epworth score, E-P-W-O-R-T-H. I said it perhaps in a more entertaining way than uh, just taking the simple questionnaire. Mm -hmm. So what we do know is that five and less is in the population normal. And gents, you both scored five. Mm. So anybody who's eight and above is statistically sleepy. So uh, you guys can uh, wipe any sweat off the brow, which I know wasn't really there. But um, yeah, so you guys do have that. So over time, I still would ask everybody, anybody listening in, go to f -word score, measure it. I mean, you can take a look at it in a more starchy way if needed. So therefore, there is a conversation of putting this into it out of our so, lives. Just keep so asking break it down for us, Param. Uh, we obviously know sleep's more important than we did before as a society that... Uh, help our immunity, but what does it cost when, when Chris decides to sleep, you know, skip three hours of sleep um, because he decides to do more research for his clients? What, what does it actually cost him in terms of immunity? What does it cost me when I, you know, I only yeah. slept six and a half hours last night, but I did that two nights in a row. What, what does that actually cost us in yeah, terms of immunity? Yeah, I, the research that's been out there on this, so let's make sure that we speak to the research rather than uh, improvising it. So a lot of this has been looked in at, at uh, people who have sleep disorders rather than just one night of poor sleep. I mean, there's anecdotal stuff to that. So let's speak to where a person is like sleep apnea. So somebody who has sleep apnea uh, and you can grade it. So that's poor airflow, right? ABC, so you got to have airway so you can breathe, that oxygen so you can circulate it. So old CPR class you might've taken, ABC, airway, breathing, circulation. That's how they break it down. So we know that a person who has mild apnea will have about double the inflammation, meaning the immune system is being taxed. It will go up three to five fold in terms of being taxed if a person has severe sleep apnea. Mm. So that one's a little bit harder to look at because that is something that's been accruing over a period of time. So we do know that that data is much more robust. So we do have some smaller data sets that will talk to people that mimic that in terms of being up, like pulling an all-nighter. The data really has um, focused much more on heart health as well as blood sugar. We do know that that person who doesn't sleep well, their inflammation markers, as I've already mentioned, go up, but also that of depositing blood sugar in a negative way. Even from just um, one hour. We've learned one hour is not so much. So first of all, I, let's frame it even better. Because that's an awesome question you're asking. Say you're sleeping pretty well. Like what is sleeping pretty well? Let's talk quantity. Seven to nine hours and you score five and less like you just did, right? So that's pretty nice. So we do know that an hour less, okay, the body could tolerate that. But let's do your example that you started with, three hours difference. So say you're normally an eight hour person, but now you're getting five. So five is really just kind of that tipping point. As we know, five and above, you really start protecting the heart. So we do know that there is a much greater tax onto it. What I also want to do is not just talk about the problem, but let's also talk about the solution. So say you sleep pretty well, but there's the one night getting ready for a great podcast that you've been up researching. 
right? So if you sleep three hours less one night, what do you have to do the next night? It's a common Chris, question. Chris, this better be a pretty fucking good podcast this. if you're losing three hours of sleep to research for it. I just want you to know that now. <laughs> this better be like an orgasmic podcast. Let's be really clear, Chris. Well, I think no. uh, Byron's <laughs> helping us. He's building. <laughs> Can, yeah. So this way, we'll also talk about performance. So he doesn't have to stay up for three hours, right? So this, we'll, we'll talk about the flip in a moment. But what we do know as we take a look at getting that recovery sleep. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's pretty darn good getting quantity and quality and they have one night of poor sleep, the next night, they don't need three more hours of sleep. What we do know is that you'll do a vast majority of what we call recovery sleep. And I'll discuss that. Well, yeah, that's because we, we do. We, that's really I'm sure both part. of us miss sleep occasionally, right, Chris? I mean, it happens. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then let me just give you the outside one. And I've never seen this published, but I heard presented at a meeting. They took people in the military, ages 18 to 49, men and women serving our country. They gave them an opportunity one week to sleep as much as they wanted. What they found is if you imagine a baseline, on day eight, they all slept roughly eight hours plus, right? So that's a healthy, rejuvenating sleep. But that first week, seven days, every day, think of a bar graph. The baseline bar on that graph is everybody slept eight hours and over that seven days, additional 25 hours. So think of that. Would you guys ever think, hey, I'm not going to go on holiday. I'm just going to sleep an extra 25 hours this week. No. So it gives you an appreciation of why recovering can be a little bit gruesome and a little bit difficult. So therefore, do know people can recover and it could be taking some time. So that's the reason. Minimize the, the, the challenges of getting sleep and seek the opportunity of pri prioritizing it. So when you prioritize it, you're going to get a much better opportunity, right? Whatever you set your mind to, uh, whatever the mind can conceive of, the body can achieve. So we always want to set people up that way. So... With that being a, a conversation and thinking about it, I brought up this topic, recovery sleep. Have either of you guys ever heard of that? No. That no. being phrased that way? No, I have not. Mm -hmm. So let me go to a fun way to think about it. All right, Neil and Chris, when were you guys the very, very best sleepers? What age? Anybody, you two, your families? I think probably my teenage years. Bingo. Right off the bat, Chris, extra credit. Mm -hmm. So what do we know from that? Mm -hmm. We know many people say t babies. Babies get 17 hours, but that's fragmented sleep, right? Eat, sleep, poop, mm -hmm. eat, sleep, poop, right? Not a great lifestyle if you and I wanted to live <laughs> days, get through a podcast or not anything else like that. Do, right? <laughs> so what do teenagers do? Let's frame that. They get to sleep. They stay asleep. Have any of you ever woken up a teenager before yes. they're ready? Oh, uh, it's a very <sighs> difficult endeavor. <laughs> very hard. Me, wasn't even worth it. Should have just let it go, right? Uh -huh. So what I want us to think about is what do teenagers know? Well, it's not so much they know, but what does their chemistry know? So we often talk about seven to nine hours of sleep quantity-wise, but let's talk about this recovery. Artificially, gentlemen, break it into the first half of the night and then the second half of the night. First half, you do more deep sleep. Second half of the night, you do more dreams. All right, what goes on in deep sleep? You and I repair, physical repair. So you've had a good workout. Are you feeling a few muscles you haven't felt in a while? You wanna get the full benefit of that workout? Gotta get your sleep. The biggest thing right now out there in sports medicine is getting sleep. And do know that, think of it's body repair. Right, Neil and Chris, you guys said this is about immune health right now. Think about that physical repair. Second topic, let's move to the second half of the night, dreams. A part of your brain has a funny name. It's called the limbic system. You don't need to know that at all. But instead, know what it does. It clears negative thoughts. The guy who cut you off today, somebody who said something rude to you, that old negative self-talk that just won't go away, should have, could have. Should have done another, I've gotten an extra basis point for your clients today, Chris. Yeah. Absolute, right? And that, every single night, it gets cleared out. Think of that. 100 years ago, we talked about IQ. What became the rage of the 90s? EQ. Emotionally lean clear. When you're emotionally clear, you can be more present, and that's where our best work occurs. So sleep is about physical repair and emotional clearing. Mm -hmm. And we know stress on any level will tax the immune system. 
Stress can be physical, mental, emotional. Any level of those can tax the immune system. So please, please give yourself an opportunity to think about that. And let's go for extra credit. Let's go through this one more time, but I'm going to change the topic about memory, right? Both of you, healthy gentlemen. So whether you feel your memory slipped or not, the most important thing is let's have the very best opportunity with it. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? The first half of the night, here it is. That deep sleep, imagine it's late, later tonight, you've drifted into sleep, and imagine this beautiful picture, a painting of the day you just lived, everything that's been a part of your day. Imagine this beautiful panorama. And what you're going to do in deep sleep, you're going to be like, oh, that's a picture I want to remember. Ooh, that's a fact I want to also remember. So what you're going to do is you're going to put little post-it notes and you're going to put little Polaroids into your data bank, your memory bank. Now, you're just going to accumulate those. Let's take this 2.0. Go from your deep now to your dream. In dreams, you're, what you're going to do is you're going to make connections between post-it notes and Polaroids that were not spoon-fed to you during the day you just lived. Think of what that means. Two people can read the same thing, but a great investor, a great entrepreneur is going to do what? Make connections that others haven't. Mm -hmm. And even deeper than that, you're going to connect the old Polaroids in your data bank, in your memory bank, with the new ones, mm -hmm. as well as the post-it notes. Mm -hmm. This is creativity problem solving. Think of that. Who wants that? Mm -hmm. All of us want that. Mm -hmm. Sleep is about our immune health, but it's also about performing. And a day that we're living in right now, we've all got to make our best choices. We've got to synthesize things. We've got to be a step ahead. So sleep is directly on the immune system. So, so do I hear, set you up to I hear that choices, right? And to have best your food. creativity level is more likely to go up if you've had more consistent sleep. Yes. And if you define creativity, that's, that's typically you connections creativity that is, others right? haven't. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. I'd agree with that as a definition. Um, yeah. Yeah. So as you guys think about that in terms of the sleep, right? Easily said, let's make this realistic, right? Let's give ourselves a couple of things that all of us can do, right? I mean, you can go see a doctor, get a full evaluation, make sure that there isn't something physical. But let's go through. One of the things I love to talk about, and you know, I've, I've, I've said this to many different audiences, so let me make sure I say it to this one. Here's a simple concept that I don't hear anybody talking about or writing about. Your daytime sets up your nighttime. And let's finish it. Your nighttime sets up your next day. So what we do during our daytime sets us up. So let's think about that right here and now. What can you do to get more deep sleep? Here it is, burn up energy, muscle, aerobic, Eat foods that don't make you swing up and down. In other words, eat real food, not processed food. So if I can get everybody to take a step of doing some more movement, get a huff and puff, and also eat well, Chris, no more Doritos do is that for person you. burns up more energy. And when they burn up more energy, hmm. <laughs> <Right. laughs> uh, <laughs> killing me softly. <laughs> going on top of that there. So think of it, right? Let's not get carried away. If you work out so much that you're in pain, does pain help you sleep? No, no. So there's a limit to what we need to do. Throwing kettlebells around at midnight is not going to help you. <laughs> now, let's work on the second half of the night. We clear out negative thoughts. What's a, f a famous thing that goes on? Many people say, Parm, dude, I get to sleep just fine. But in the middle of the night, say 3 a.m., I click open my eyes and my thoughts are running and I can't stop it. I can guarantee you somebody listening to this, many people listening to this right now are having that experience. It's one of the most common. Why does that occur? Think of it. You just paid off your deep sleep and now you're starting to do that emotional clearing. Mm -hmm. And if you have not done some of the clearing during the daytime, what will happen at night? It's path of least resistance. It's going to now be quiet. You paid off your physical repair. You've done your physical repair. You paid off physical exhaustion. And now you're going to start churning on something. So what I want everybody to know before bedtime, create a ritual, power down, make it something very soothing. Do something that is relaxing. Have something that helps you let go of the day you just lived. Mm. Create a to-do list. Do something that you're like, oh, it's my time. Finally, everybody else has been given. My clients, my family, anybody that I'm responsible to, this is my protected time. 
because we're going from a buzzed life and dropping into sleep. And we got away with it when we were younger. But every decade after our uh, roughly our age 30, sleep and the quality of sleep and that recovery sleep slips. But don't be disappointed in the fact that we're getting older. Let's say now the rules of engagement. We did not have to think about how we eat, how we move, and how we clear stress when we're our teens and our 20s. Somewhere around age 40, people show into my office saying, dude, you know what happened? And it's not working like it used to. Mm-hmm. Because now we have to do Chris, something I, for I ourselves. I know you journal a lot. So do you just, actually write? To, and I know, you, we, we, you know we both meditate. We've been together to meditate. Do you, do you make mm-hmm. to-do lists before you sleep? I have not. I um, very much like this idea because I have felt um, with this crisis and the change in the collective consciousness and a bit of panic and fear, we were bombarded with those messages. Um, my sleep pattern has changed a bit. So due to the crisis, um, I've been doing it more. And I'm, but I've started, I think I, I never realized until yeah. now it may be leading to deeper sleep. Hmm. Well, I, mm. I've started to meditate both in the morning and uh, bookends uh, uh, when I awaken and before I go to sleep, and that's helped tremendously. Um, but yeah, I like the idea of a checklist. I already do certain things like, you know, none of the electronics, uh, no cell phones, no screens in the bedroom, um, and then lowering the lights about 30 minutes before I go to bed. No, actually written a checklist of the stuff you want to do tomorrow. Just think about later or whatever. Yeah, do the data dump, clear it out. So that way you give yourself permission tomorrow morning, lock and load, you're jumping right back into it. We got to give ourselves an appreciation that we all have. We're not just physical. We're our thoughts and how we feel. And we need to give them both an opportunity to taper before bedtime. And, and, um, Parm, do you have advice for people who feel like this has affected them or changed their sleep patterns? Oh, yeah. You know, here's the biggest thing. Whatever we make a priority, let me phrase it another way. Every single diet plan out there shows benefit. Why? Because when people pay more attention to what they're doing, they do something that's helpful. If I were to ask everybody to appreciate now that time and quality, right? So let's do the first one, right? The low hanging fruit is getting yourself enough time because you need both cues, quantity and quality. So just the very fact that we've talked about how important it is, you're gonna see a vast majority of people speaking about the benefit they get. It is pretty darn cool. Hmm. Interesting. Do you, I know you've got to get going, uh, Parham. Do you have any other last thoughts for our listeners? Yes. Please appreciate sleep will shift in your life and just keep the conversation going. Be curious with it. And if these things are not getting you very far up the road and getting you to that of your sleep, talk to someone, your medical team. And do know that a lot of people are learning about sleep. So if you don't get help at first, keep knocking on the door. There is better science. There's better testing. There's better ways to look at it. But just give it an appreciation the way we the way we move and get your sleep. Grandma's message. Hey, uh, before you go, quick post note for you. uh, Don't close your browser because it uploads our podcast. So you can put yourself on mute and not participate. That's just fine. Um, And we'll put a link to your LinkedIn in the show notes Uh, so people can find you and follow you. Um, Thanks very much. Yeah. um, Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thanks, Barbara. More to come. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for your participation. Thanks for your information. It's been great. All right, gentlemen. So um, we have to have him at some point on to talk about the the cannabis market because he spent a lot of time studying it as well. Not not from the market perspective, but Mm -hmm. from medical perspective. Yeah. Yeah, but from the health benefits and medical perspective. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think that would be great, Neil. I um, very much appreciate you uh, bringing him on. That was fantastic. I do think sleep science is advancing us and our understanding. Of course, I came up in an era where sleep was discounted, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. I think my dad used to subscribe to that uh, when he first started his company. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you know, actually, though, he took a nap every day for about probably, I'll say 80% of the time for about 20 minutes in the afternoon. They said, yeah, there's a great intelligence. 
You know, I think even just looking like what Parham was saying, when you look to the animal kingdom, the animals know what to do when they're injured or sick. They go and find a quiet place to lie down. And um, I guess in all of our mental exertions and activity, we've sort of lost touch sometimes with what the physical body really needs. Um, so it's, it's, it's really good to see uh, medical science. Uh, you know, it reminded some of the conversation b before we hop off the sleep conversation um, reminded me of a friend you told me you took to Deer Park Monastery for meditation. And afterwards, he started meditating even more. I think he lives in Danville, California, this friend of yours. Um, he started meditating even more and needed a lot less sleep. I'm super curious at some point to, to learn more about the link between um, meditation, uh, which leads to rest, and sleep, which leads to rest. Have you have you read much about that? No, but I have a personal experience with it. You know, um, as I mentioned, I I um, have gone back and forth. I, I meditate daily, but um, there are long stretches where I'll do uh, two meditations a day, following the great Bapu, <laughs> who said I must Gandhi. meditate Got it. two hours yeah. every day. Gandhi, yes, yeah, yeah. When he was told he couldn't meditate an hour a day, he said he must do two hours a day then. If there are more pressures, then certainly you probably need to rest um, your mind and your body more. And that's what uh, he did and learning from him as a great master, I think, uh, when times uh, feel more turbulent, I've taken to um, doubling down on meditation. And interestingly, Neil, I felt it doesn't, uh, it, it relieves me of the time to sleep too. I, I wake up more refreshed and sooner um, and really ready um, with how, the, how much the How much are you averaging meditation right now? 12. And then we'll move away from this part of the subject. Um, I, uh, morning 30 minutes, um, a little longer, between 30 and 35 on minutes side. on each um, session. So, so yeah, about an hour to an hour and Every 15 day. minutes, okay. hour and 10 minutes a day. Interesting. Um, what mm -hmm. else do you think we need to cover before we end this podcast? I think um, it was a it was a great message. It's a stressful time, um, not because the world is necessarily um, different, though we have a common enemy to fight. I think it all the messages that we hear keep obscuring all the beautiful things in the world that are right. It is springtime in America. It's beautiful. The flowers and the birds are chirping. It is um, something we have to keep touching too, touching what is right um, and not just thinking about all the problems or challenges that we face. So that's a really good message. And I think that helps us to recover and keep our sanity in all this. I, I... What's right, Neil? You have the love of Mriganta. Yes. Yes. Zan loves you, your dog. Uh -huh. Yeah, be like a dog, right? <laughs> Let no insult stick. Always be happy and be ready to your go. tail. And be ready to go. <laughs> the big time stuff that I wish I had. The big time stuff that I make you mad. The big time stuff. Big time stuff. I like the big time stuff. Big time stuff. I like the big time stuff that I never had.